Okay. Good morning, everybody, members of the committee, witnesses, and the public. Uh, we're going to spend the first hour this morning dealing with an amendment possibly to the Budget Adjustment Act that sponsored by Senator Pearson. I don't know if you have co-sponsors, but um, uh, I'm going to let you explain it. Is Becky Wasserman here with us? Is she coming? She, it's my understanding she's coming in about 15, 10 minutes. Okay. You'll walk us through the event. Sure. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair, committee, uh, Senator Chris Pearson from Chittenden. And uh, Scott, nice to meet you. Thanks for all your help uh, over email. Uh, you're a new uh, staffer. I haven't had the chance to bump into you. So thank you very much. You're welcome, sir. It's great, by the way. <laughs> good. Um, and, and thank you, Senator Ballant, who also serves on uh, appropriations, been uh, dogged right there with me uh, trying to do this. And, and I, I, you know, I, I remark in my time in Montpelier, when you start to try to boost wages uh, and help workers, people, it gets complicated quickly. And even in many cases when it doesn't need to be at all. Uh, and I think that's the case here. Um, I'll just try to set the stage a little bit and, and tell you what we're trying to do, although um, I don't want to go too far because I think you all are probably more expert in this than I am. Um, it's not a secret that we have uh, a raging case of income inequality in this state and in this country, uh, deeply, deeply concerning uh, for the health of our nation and our communities, and we're not immune to that. Um, and, and at the heart of that is uh, a wage problem that has not kept up at the same time. Um, executive pay pay at the very top is exploded in the last, uh, well, I guess 40 years easily. Um, dramatic charts. If you haven't seen that, I'm glad to send them along. Um, and we have, uh, as a state, as a community, uh, uh, figured out a, a very straightforward principle when the state is paying for construction projects ourselves through the capital bill, we make sure that the people doing the work get paid well, uh, get paid decently, get paid fairly. You know, this is not um, putting Cadillacs in a uh, sheet rockers driveway, but, but basically ensuring that the people shoveling gravel and, and holding the flags on the highway, that they're, they're looked after and, and treated fairly. And the feds do the same thing. In the federal case, it's called the Davis-Bacon Law, I think, or Davis-Bacon Wages. And for Vermont, um, uh, we call it the prevailing wage, or sometimes it's called the mini Davis-Bacon. Same idea. When we're spending public dollars, it's absurd to pay people in a way that has them then dependent on public services, right? I think that's at the core of this. Uh, you should earn a wage when you're working for the public. That that means you're not in poverty. So we apply it already to capital projects. We, as the chair said, we uh, in 2009 under the Douglas administration, we applied uh, the prevailing wage or Davis Bacon. Um, whichever sort of uh, hooked, if you like, to ARA dollars, the last time the feds were, were spending significant uh, stimulus dollars our way. And what I'm offering here is that we just apply the prevailing wage to ARPA dollars. Their uh, ARPA's guidance imagines that states will do this, um, but they did not ins insist on it hooking to Davis Bacon. You know, I don't know why, but but they clearly entertain that. So what we're asking here is is not for the whole, not every dollar that goes out for ARPA, but when it's construction, when it's sizable construction, over two hundred thousand dollars is the threshold that I've picked, and we can talk about that if you want. It mirrors; it's actually a little higher a threshold um, than we use in the capital. Bill, but I just want to try to make this as simple as possible. So any construction project over $200,000, getting over $200,000 of ARPA money must use, uh, must adhere to the prevailing wage. Um, that's that's the guts of it. Um, the There is a carve out, and, and if you don't have the language, I'll, I'll send you the latest, uh, but I think Scott has that. There's a carve out that says, if Davis Bacon applies, then you know, Davis Bacon overrides the prevailing wage. So again, my aim here is to be simple, to keep this really simple. And some say, well, why don't you wait for the big bill? The budget adjustment spends hundreds of millions of dollars of ARPA. So, so I, I'm not eager to wait any longer. I think, I think we should have really done this last year. I regret 
not no, not being on top of it. I think you're going to hear from contractors that are basically going to say, this is not a big deal. We, we do this all the time. Uh, these are not mom and pop operations. These are tend to be folks that are bidding on big contracts. They're in fact used to, and probably in many cases, will have to deal with Davis Bacon, just slightly more onerous in terms of administration already. Um, uh, but you know, for the the those those projects that we're funding um, that don't have Davis Bacon apply, we need to make sure our, our folks are taken care of. Now, the job market is strong right now. And it's quite likely that a lot of these wages, you know, that this isn't going to have a huge impact right today uh, because the, the, the job market uh, is such that workers get well paid. But ARPA is going to be around for another two years. Um, and so I, I think it's important to guarantee. Um, and just to remind you, our prevailing wage has a regional impact. So it's particularly important for kingdom folks working in the kingdom. It's particularly important working down south probably going to have less impact uh, around Chittenden County and, and Northwestern Vermont. Um, and um, so, so that's basically the principle. Um, the compliance and administration, we're trying to make this very simple and not loop in, you know, entities and state government so that it just sort of adds another layer. We want to make this as simple as possible. My understanding is that basically this would um, go into any contract. It would go into a bid, you know, requirement. Once, if this becomes law, it becomes a requirement before you even bid. So it's straightforward there. Then when you get a grant, you're signing the contract and you're adhering to the law, which would be in this case, the prevailing wage. And there's been some question about how we do oversight. Um, what I've been able to gather from, from Damian Leonard and Becky Wasserman is that the Department of Labor through the Wage and Hour Division has broad authority over making sure people get paid the, the, the wages of, of, of under the law. And so I think this would fall under there. It would effectively be complaint driven. Davis Bacon requires a contractor every month to sort of certify that's, and, and then we, the question comes, well, where would we send that? And, and so again, in the, in the name of simplicity and making this as easy as possible to administer, we're not requiring that, but we require it up front in the contracts. Um, and we understand that if a worker was uh, not being paid fairly, they could bring a complaint just the same way a worker could bring a complaint about not getting minimum wage. And it would fall under statute under Department of Labor and Wage and, uh, wage and Hour Division. So, um, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to keep this very simple. We're, we're, we're not, you know, asking for a complicated thresholds, just any pro construction project getting over $200,000 of ARPA dollars, this would trigger, uh, could be overridden by Davis Bacon, in which case it's out of our hands. And I'm very hopeful we could do this. And, um, and I would be honored, um, by the way, if I, I'm not exactly sure how this advances, but my hunch is that uh, it will be a floor amendment. And, and if anybody wanted to join me as a co-sponsor, I'd be glad to have you. Um, but maybe we'll sort of that settle that uh, a little later in the day. But thanks for taking the time. I appreciate it. I know you had to juggle your schedule. It means a lot to me. Thank you, uh, Senator Sorokin and everybody. Thank you, Senator Pearson. That was a very good overview. I have two things. Uh, you said it would apply for two more years. Wouldn't it really apply for four more years to when ARPA dollars have to be spent by? Yeah, 2024, right? They have to be obligated, but Obligate, then they could be but spent, spent by 26. I think. Okay, well, yeah, all the more important. And and you'll see in the latest language, it's an excellent point, and, and you're you're making my point stronger. So thank you. Um one of the things and one of the reasons why I want to do it in budget adjustment, if at all possible, is not only because budget adjustment itself, uh, that that piece of legislation spends hundreds of millions of ARPA dollars, but there's also money that we appropriated in the big bill last year that hasn't gone out the door. Right. And so, again, in the name of simplicity, you'll see the language, the latest draft says, you know, this is, we're not going to retroactively apply. I don't want, you know, I don't want anyone to be able to come in and say, well, we already put out RFIs or RFPs or we're in negotiations. None of that. 
But for any project, because I, I, I am confident there is money sitting there that was appropriated that hasn't even gotten started yet. And I want for those, I want this to apply to ideally. Um, and, and again, not mucking with anything that's, that's underway, but um, so it's, it just said, speaks to me to the importance. And as you say, Senator Sorokin, um, actually many years out, which, which I think backs up the idea that even if it doesn't impact wages right away because of where the uh, job market is right now, um, it's important to do because it's impossible to predict what it's going to look like in two, three years. Well, um, in, in the name of simplicity, I'm glad you took that position on retroactive because I think it might have some contract clause yeah. implications. And I'd be interested to hear from Becky where that cutoff is because if someone's signed a contract, <clears throat> they, even though they haven't started work, it may have some contract clause implications under the constitution to try and change that after the contract has been signed. So right. we'll hear from Becky on that. Do you- well, Be Becky, has jo Becky has joined us. Okay, do you, do you um, when we did ARA, did we extend that to other contracts as well? I mean, there's a lot of um, ARPA money going out for like human service contracts. Uh, mental health and all that stuff. I assume that this one would only, you said over and over again, only construction contracts. Yeah. But I, I, is there any reason why to limit it to that and in the past to be limited to that? Um, the, the, the reason, as I understand it, and I'd be glad for, for, for uh, Becky to bail me out here, is that that's what prevailing, our prevailing wage law applies to. Um, and, and so, you know, I, I would be glad to work with all of you to figure out how we make sure, uh, other types of grantees get paid well, but we kind of have this structure already when it comes to construction and, and, um, I figured at a minimum that was important to, to adhere to. Okay. Any other questions for Senator Pearson? Uh, Senator Sorokin, let me just read quickly the, the, the way that we've drafted this makes clear that in terms of those FY22 appropriations that haven't started, it will not apply uh, uh, if the project has been invited or advertised for bid, the project is under contract or the funds are obligated. So we're trying to, you know, narrowly make sure if there's a hundred million dollars left over that hasn't sort of gotten underway from last year, want it to apply there, but not complicate anything. And I appreciate Becky's drafting there. I think that's a decent start, but um, you know, if Lori or others have, have suggestions, we're very open to that. Let me say, before I take questions from Senator Brock and Senator Clarkson, um, I asked Chris, you know, we have a very busy schedule and to have us take an hour even to deal with this, uh, I, I made it clear to Chris he had to sort of deliver a turnkey amendment that we didn't have to run around and get information on. I think he started off with a very good presentation and touched all the bases. So that's 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 good. Uh, Senator Clarkson. Uh, I'm just curious, having been involved with the era uh, appropriations and the effort on this with you in the House, uh, Chris, do we did BGS and VTrans and the people who applied this value and this requirement, do we have any data about how it actually lifted wages and how many projects it applied to as a result of that work? I mean, I'm just curious because my gut absolutely completely supports this. I supported it in the house, but the, I, I'm just, you know, it's yet another frustration, you know, my, cause my, anyway, I'm just curious. Do we, do we think BGS has any, information about that? Well, it's a hard question to answer. And I, I certainly don't have data. But I can tell you that every time we've brought this up, it's been a heck of a fight. And that yes. suggests to me that it will have some impact. Um, I know that recently, uh, we we changed it so that these, these wage rates are routinely upgraded. In fact, if you look at uh, our, the ARA language, 2009 um, right. came out of this committee, in fact, your committee, 
Um, they say, you know, D they apply Davis Bacon and then said, but in, if Davis Bacon is outdated, then we'll use Vermont prevailing wage. So they were acknowledging that sometimes one of the downsides of, of both the federal and state rule is that the wages aren't routinely upgraded. Now we we upgrade it very regularly in in prevailing in the prevailing wage statute, and somebody described it to me. This isn't just some number we've plucked out of thin air. This is the prevailing wage. Like it's 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 a survey of what people are actually paying. So it's not designed to um, really in give give strong wages. It's designed to protect against people getting getting subpar wages right um you know and of, and of course like right now an electrician or a plumber they can command a very very significant wage right they're they're very hard to find blah 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 but it's the person that's holding the flag you know the the go slow stop flag it's the person that is is really kind of at the entry level that we need to protect and and i think effectively that's what those are the folks that have been the target um, of these laws. And, and there are other witnesses who can tell you a little bit more about it. Right. And I guess my, the other piece of that question that as we explore, because as you know, we're passionate about wage in this committee. And, uh, and, and I would just love if we could ever get the data and the, and, and this to, to look at how prevailing wage compares to livable wage, because as we try and lift all boats, this is, you know, this is a standard that we could conceivably apply elsewhere. I, I can, I'll be glad to email you the DOL list of wages. And the, the short answer is it's considerably greater than a, 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 a livable wage. Senator Brock. Uh, I just want to understand the mechanics of, of what we're doing today. Uh, this, as I understand, is going to be an amendment uh, to a bill that's on the floor today. Is that right? Yes. My understanding is the amendment, if it's offered, would be offered before third reading. Correct. And so the question then becomes, uh, how, what testimony uh, are, are we hearing uh, about issues such as, one, is there any inflationary impact? B, how does it affect the total amount of money we'll be spending? Three, what does it cost? Four, what's the difference between the prevailing wage and the wages that are being paid on construction jobs that are funded with ARPA funds today? Uh, and I could go down the list of questions. And if I understand it correctly, we've got an hour. That's correct. And you can ask all those questions. But Well, will I get answers to any of those questions? Well, you may. From, from who? Well, we have the state. We have construction. We have the state here. We have the construction industry. Uh, I'm looking around if we have anybody else. Becky may have it. Um, so, but well, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that's that's all that's all we can do. And certainly, you have well, your right to make your to, to make, an effort to deal with a subject like this of this magnitude is wholly inadequate. And I don't think we can ever do justice to this. Now, the notion that we, we should, should discuss it, I absolutely agree that this is something that is worthy of discussion. But to rush this through in this manner, I think, does not do a good service to our fiscal responsibility and stewardship. I, I guess I would comment, Senator Brock, uh, the prevailing wage law has been around for a long time, was the subject of careful compromise, and I've... I've been around personally when it's been updated um, and, and modernized. And each of those debates was more than a little intense and was more than a half an hour here or there. It was weeks and weeks of testimony. It was a very carefully crafted compromise. And now we don't debate it every year when we fund capital projects. We apply the principle that the legislature has landed on uh, the federal government applies the principle that they've landed on in, in Davis-Bacon. When, when we were starting to get this drafted, I said, let's include the infrastructure bill that is money about to come to the state through the federal. And, and the research indicates that that already has Davis-Bacon. I don't know. I don't follow Congress closely, but I don't think they had to debate that. They just applied the principle of the way they do business through federal construction projects. 
That's what I'm asking for here. So I don't, I don't think this is a fresh issue. I don't think that we need to deeply get into the ins and outs of it. I think what, what I'm asking is that we would apply the principle we apply to our own dollars, to this billion dollars that the feds have, have handed us and we are aiming to get out the door as fast and effectively as possible to do some much needed work um, in the construction field and elsewhere. And when we're doing it in the construction, we ought to apply the same exact principle we do when we're funding um, projects straight from state coffers. Well, I would just add, uh, note that Davis-Bacon is not something that is, with, is, is absent of controversy, including in the federal law uh, today. Uh, the, the arguments relate to inflation, uh, the fact that uh, Davis-Bacon typically, a prevailing wage typically means union wage as opposed to the wage being paid by contractors, the vast majority of which are non-union in the normal course of business. Uh, how much will this cost? I think is a very fundamental thing that, that we should be talking about and understanding in terms of the amount that we're spending of this federal money. Will it take away the ability to do other projects? Is there a problem that we in fact are solving? All of these are things that for us to, to talk about this with this amount of money involved uh, in the space of less than an hour, I think is irresponsible. Well, that's a decision that this committee will vote on and have to make a decision on. Uh, you know, the flip side of that is the trains leaving the station and all these contracts are being let and people should, I think the state should be a model citizen in what it pays its people with the dollars it has. We do it for general fund in the capital bill. We do it with federal dollars in Davis-Bacon. We're not, we're not recreating the wheel here. We're just changing the breadth of coverage of uh, the, way, uh, the programs that are covered. And um, so, I mean, I don't, I, don't, I don't disagree with your logic, Senator Brock. I come to a different conclusion. And so, Mr. Mr. Chair, may I just also add, we aren't reinventing the wheel here. We did the, the last time we had a huge infusion of federal money. We did almost exactly the same thing. And uh, Randy, we may have answers to your questions from Matt and Lori. So it's not like we're, we haven't done this before. We did this almost exactly uh, 11, however many years ago, uh, surprising number of years ago, but almost exactly the same thing. Oh, okay. Let's, I think we may have some answers to some of those questions. You know, the one of the difficulties is by having the debate on the merits or the process, we are eating away at the limited time we admittedly do have. So we're going to have to make a decision as a committee. We are, you know, it, it is possible that we would have spent more time on, on something like this if we had it. I'm not so sure, quite frankly, that it's needed. But We'll move on. I think our next witness is um, Chris. Do you think you're you are scheduling the witness? Is Becky the right one, or should we say is or should we say Becky for the end? Um, well, that's a question. I, you know, Becky would help walk you through the language. So if that's where your questions lie, you know, I would turn to her. Um, certainly, the. Uh, Associated General Contractors is an, is their response to be honest surprised me uh, in the vein of not a big deal. Becky, uh, Becky how uh, long can you be with us for the remainder of the hour? Sure. Yes, I'd be glad to. No, Becky, are you? Oh. With me? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I can be here. Okay, let's hear from Matt then next. Oh, thank Matt, you very much. You? Oh, great. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Great. Well, for the record, my name is Matt Musgrave. I'm uh, with the Associated General Contractors of Vermont. Uh, thank you very much. It's uh, my pleasure to be before this committee for the first time this year. I always enjoy visiting with you. Uh, Senator Clarkson, if I may uh, take a moment to uh, just give you an update on a project that I told you I was working on several years ago related to workforce development. Uh, you asked me, uh, I think it was three years ago now, uh, if I would focus my energy on bringing more people or more women into the construction workforce. And I want to let you know that we're working very hard on that. Uh, I, I may have mentioned that last year we had a uh, program, a grant program that we put together to offer uh, companies that would hire women uh, personal protective equipment that was specifically designed uh, for a woman. 
Uh, we've been working with our national association uh, on a number of different fronts on that. And next week we have our workforce development committee that I've enlisted uh, Representative Rogers from the House Energy Committee, who's gonna come in and talk to us a little bit about how we can uh, better reduce barriers for uh, women to enter this business, uh, which I think will go a long way for, uh, I mean, as you said, raising all ships, you know, the wage and, and lifestyle that people get out of this industry is, is well above the livable wage. Which brings me to my testimony on this, and I don't have written testimony that I present pre prepared for you today. I had a, a brief phone conversation with Senator Pearson yesterday on this. And I just want to quote myself uh, from a committee uh, that I, I spoke in last year in institutions when this question came up, uh, should prevailing wage rates be applied to school projects? And my question was, uh, my answer was, you have some money for school projects? Let's do this. And I, I'm, I'm pretty much there with ARPA as well. Um, you know, I, I'll, I'll leave it to Lori to explain some of the ins and outs of, of how the programs work. Uh, but I represent the Associated General Contractors, and, and we generally support construction as a whole. But I'm going to speak to my membership really quickly. I did a brief poll yesterday uh, of several members that would be involved with these types of projects. And in fact, they are at, in, at minimum paying these, these rates to get people to stay at work and to attract people to these jobs. Um, so we see it as uh, we don't see it as a major hurdle for our membership to, to do this work. It's also something that they're familiar with. Uh, about 60 to 70 percent of my membership uh, works with VTrans, and they're very used to doing uh, the Davis-Bacon reporting, which is uh, significantly different than uh, the prevailing wage. Uh, and then when I talk to our prevailing wage folks, again, you're, you're talking to a professional contractor association, and these are the folks that are generally winning the bids. They're generally doing these large projects and they're fit to do these uh, types of programs. Um, I mean, as far as what the, any negatives I can think of with the prevailing wage being applied, um, I think it maybe uh, would be prohibitive from a new contractor or a smaller contractor to compete with some of my members and we're fine with that. Um, the other side of that is that um, the money is finite and I think someone mentioned it before um, one of the things that I'm working on, and, and you'll be invited to this, uh, we have a three-part series that we're working on for cost inputs for construction. Um, and that's in the building side, that's in the road side, and that's in uh, the workforce side. And, you know, government mandates and stuff are certainly a piece of the cost factor, um, although it's not the only one. We have to deal with supply chain. We have to deal with attracting a workforce. We have to apply safety protocols to keep people safe on the job. Um, so applying the Davis-Bacon uh, Davis or prevailing wage, um, it's, it's your money, you're choosing how to spend it. And because it is a finite resource, you will spend more money on projects that go out the door, which may limit the capacity for the number of projects. But with that being said, I, I think that and with respect to the time that we have, I'm going to say that um, you know, we're, we're prepared to, to work with whatever the committee chooses on this. And uh, we thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Senator Clarkson. Thanks, Matt. Um, can you give us a notion? You say it's not really much of a hurdle. First of all, thank you on the on, on anything to do to get more women into construction. Uh, I think it's really a win-win, and I'm really excited to hear that and look forward to hearing more. Um, uh, prevailing wage versus what's being paid now. Uh, it, it's almost negligible, is my guess. Can you give us a notion of what that is? So you I'm going to... I'm going to give a plug here really quickly to a platform that we developed um, and that will be uh, marketed shortly, vermontconstructionjobs.com. I'll put it in the chat after my testimony so that you can go and check out the website. On the website, we've gone ahead and it's, 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 the goal is to educate people on construction and the outcomes that they will have and, and what they need to come into it. So we've put a bunch of different job classifications, whether it's carpenter, electrician, uh, heavy equipment operator. And we've built these job cards for them as a video that shows what to do, what they do, what, you know, what skills they'll learn. It also shows what the uh, Bureau of Labor and Statistics average wages are in Vermont for those jobs. So we're already educating people on, on what those wages are. And then when you go further into that website, you can actually see a list of jobs that have been posted. We've got about 30 up there. The, the website's only just been launched. We'll, we anticipate 100, 150 jobs will be posted within the month. When I look at those wages, 
There are some that fall slightly below, but those are very low entry level jobs that people are only paid that wage for a short period of time until they take their safety training. And I'm talking $15, $16 an hour. When you start getting into a level two, level three laborer positions, you're very much in that that prevailing wage category. Again, I'm only speaking to my membership. I don't know about the contractors that aren't even my membership. Thanks. And, okay. and just a, a, a favor, uh, Scott, if you could, for those of us who have a hard time doing chat when we're in committee, can you grab that uh, website and put it in our somewhere, email it to us, maybe. Thanks. Okay, thank you. We're gonna move on to Lori. Welcome, Lori, good to see you again. Good morning, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, and I'm happy to be here. I uh, have had an opportunity to read the proposed amendment and probably I would be echoing some of what you've already heard from Senator Pearson and from Matt um, concerning some of the history and, and the reason for Laurie, uh, can, wanting- can, Lori, can you introduce yourself? And tell I'm us sorry, yes. Um, my name is Lori Valburn. For those of you that I don't know, um, I'm the Director of Civil Rights at the Vermont Agency of Transportation. It's a position that I've held for 24 years. Among other things, our agency has responsibility for, uh, and my office has responsibility for overseeing um, all of the construction projects and ensuring compliance with Davis-Bacon wage laws that apply to uh, the vast majority of our agency's construction projects. Um, so in terms of uh, the proposed amendment today, um, I. First of all, I wanna give a shout out um, to Matt and AGC. It is a fabulous website. Hope everybody checks it out. And part of it is to be encouraging more people to uh, be attracted to uh, construction jobs, which would be critical. I think that that's part of the goal of this amendment, which is to uh, make sure that for folks that are um, going to be working on public projects, that they're being paid a fair wage. And that's accomplished and it's been accomplished um, for close to hundred years using Davis-Bacon wage laws on federally funded projects. It's not without controversy and it's not a perfect system. It's kind of clunky and clumsy. And I think that anytime that Congress is considering um, the passage of legislation that's going to provide emergency types of funds, there's always a consideration of whether Davis-Bacon is going to somehow uh, disincentivize um, certain contractors from participating and bidding on projects. It's also a matter of um, all of the administrative aspects of it that can slow things down. So for the ARPA funds, uh, Congress did look at this and they uh, decided against it. We've seen similar instances with some natural disaster emergency funding, such as Katrina and others. Um, in the case of the ARA funding, a decision was made that Davis-Bacon should apply to those stimulus funds. The guidance that we see that the Treasury came out with on this in their interim final rule um, speaks to the issue of whether or not uh, Davis-Bacon uh, should be applying. And while they didn't mandate it, they did recognize um, as I think Senator Pearson referenced, that um, state prevailing wage laws, which are commonly called mini Davis-Bacon laws, may very well apply to projects. And that's what our state prevailing wage law is. It's a mini Davis-Bacon uh, wage law. Um, what the guidance also says specifically is that Treasury is encouraging recipients to ensure that the projects use strong labor standards, including labor and community benefit agreements, that offer at or above the prevailing rate and include some local higher provisions. So that gives us some idea of the congressional intent, which I think is should be guiding um, us in terms of where do we go from here? Um, I totally agree that the benefit of the state prevailing wage law over federal Davis-Bacon is that it's much uh, less onerous for uh, the contractors, um, as well as whoever's overseeing the grants and contracts that are being administered. Um, the collection and review of certified uh, wages um, 
and uh, trying to ensure that where there's a missing wage classification that you're able to obtain a federal USDOL approval of any missing wage classifications really slows things down and it creates a whole different level of administrative heartburn. So the benefit of the state prevailing wage laws um, as this committee knows is that um, it is updated on an annual basis to reflect what the actual uh, surveys indicate are the prevailing wages. It includes many more classifications that would apply to uh, um, the majority of the ARPA projects that are being funded, the construction side of the ARPA funding. Um, and I think that in general, it's a much easier wage uh, scheme for the contractors to adhere to, which is one of the reasons why um, we don't see that much um, resistance or complaints uh, from the contracting community when it comes to the state prevailing wage laws. The one thing I would say is um, I think it is critical that um, if this does pass, that it doesn't be made retroactive. It sounds like you're already addressing that. And the effective date um, should be something that um, we pay attention to so that we don't inadvertently um, adversely affect um, contracts that are already in place or about to be put in place. But it sounds like um, that's already being looked at and Becky might have some additional guidance on that. Laurie, do you, um, it sounds to me like the feds, while I didn't mandate it, encouraged it. Do you have any, or does anybody have any information of other states uh, approaching it this way? I haven't done any research in that area. Uh, this just came up. I think uh, I was invited yesterday late afternoon to come in this morning. Uh -huh. So I did a little bit of research on this and mostly was interested in the congressional intent. My guess is that um, other states, um, some of them use mini Davis-Bacon laws pretty frequently. And my guess is that some of them may be applying uh, them to ARPA funding just to be consistent okay. with some of their other federal funds that aren't Davis-Bacon specific. Right. Yeah, you... Senator Clarks. Oh, uh, Lori, oh sorry. I'd, I'd, I'd love to ask you to send us that language of the from the treasury on the intent. Sure. If you email it, that uh, to Scott, that would be great. I'm um, happy to do that. I heard, I think in your testimony, something to the effect that um, Mini Davis Bacon, um, in some instances, because of the up frequently update the update, the updates happen more frequently. Um, that it's preferable. But I also heard Senator Pearson say that the amendment, which we haven't, we're going to see from um, Becky next, uh, defers to Davis Bacon over Mini Davis Bacon when both would apply. So um, does that mean that in this amendment, even though Minnie Davis-Bacon would be more current and presumably a higher wage that in those cases, the Davis, the outdated Davis-Bacon might apply? Well, I think that the um, Treasury guidance addresses this as well and specifically says that where there's a combination of funding and Davis-Bacon is one of the requirements that Davis-Bacon is going to be the one that is used. And so in that sense, uh, there is guidance in the ARPA um, law. And I think that we need to follow that um, along the same lines. I believe that um, federal Davis-Bacon would have to apply okay. to any project, any construction project that's $10 million or over. Right. Um, that's what the language in ARPA seems to suggest. Um, so it. Treasury indicated in reporting guidance that recipients must document wages and labor standards for projects over $10 million. Um, those requirements can be met with certifications that the project is in compliance with the Davis-Bacon Act. But to your question, uh, Senator Sorotkin, I know that um, back in era, uh, we, uh, and I think that Senator Clarkson referenced this earlier, 
So Act 54 is still sticking in my mind because one of the outcomes here was in an attempt to make sure that we weren't in some way, we, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, the best of both worlds. And so the outcome required that um, for a set agency of transportation, we had to come up with uh, highway wage rates under Davis-Bacon that were special ARA rates. And for the whole duration of ARA on any projects that had any ARA funding, uh, those special wage rates applied. And we had to come up with them for 14 different counties and do a side-by-side -side to make sure that we were paying the higher of whichever it was in every classification. And um, it was a little bit confusing, I would say, to some of the contractors that were working on both ARA funded and non-ARA funded projects during those construction years, uh, but we made it work and we were able to be compliant with both the spirit, the intent and the actual letter of the law of Act 54. So it sounds like uh, the question you have is whether or not to suggest that ARPA um, projects should be subject to either the hire of Minnie Davis-Bacon or Davis-Bacon. My guess is that in almost all classifications in all regions of the state, that the state prevailing wage law is gonna be higher than the Davis-Bacon rate. There might be a few exceptions, but the reason I say that is when you look at and do a side-by-side, -side, um, I think that in general, the base wage um, tends to be very similar, but once you add on the fringe that comes with sta state prevailing wage law, which is at 42.5%, that's where the state prevailing wage will, uh, ends up uh, bumping up much higher than the federal data so, space. Right? So the, the bottom line as I'm hearing it is the deference to Davis Bacon when there's two funding sources that might apply is not one, it, it might work as being one of simplicity, but the, the real issue is there's a mandate on the federal level to use Davis-Bacon. Okay, um, is Senator Brock. It's a question, uh, Lori, can you uh, uh, educate us just very briefly on the calculation of and determination of the uh, prevailing wage, particularly with respect to the adder uh, of benefits as to where that number comes from, whether it is simply a percentage that is added to the wages being paid or whether it's calculated in some other fashion. Sure, Senator Brock. Um, I'm happy to speak to that. I know that Matt Barowitz from the Vermont Department of Labor um, was unable to join us this morning. He's really the subject matter expert and um, he uh, administers the program. It's my understanding that under, um, I think, uh, an amendment to the uh, capital construction project uh, laws uh, back in 2015 or 16, uh, the commissioner of labor is required to come up with what the fringe benefit amount should be. And it's been set at, um, I believe, 42.5% since perhaps 2016 or 17. I know that it's um, included if you go to the website and look at the state prevailing wage law um, uh, booklet, so the guide. Um, I believe that it's intended to reflect a combination of um, all of the usual fringe benefits. Uh, Federal Davis-Bacon does um, give contractors credit um, for the fringe benefits that they provide in the exact same areas. It's usually um, for holiday pay and vacation pay, for health insurance, um, for um, certain types of retirement benefits and the like. And I'm not sure where the calculation came from. Um, I know the 42.5% has not been changed at all in the last um, at least four or five years. So I assume that it was based upon an analysis and a study that was done by the Department of Labor at the time. I don't know if it's been updated yet. So you said the base wages are pretty similar between Davis Bacon and Minnie Davis Bacon, it does does Davis yeah and Minnie Davis Bacon has a forty two percent add on. Does Davis Bacon have any add on? 
they do in certain classifications in certain counties. And so it's kind of odd um, because you would think that it would apply more across the board, but the whole way that US Department of Labor conducts their prevailing wage surveys is a little bit unique. And um, I think it's unfortunate that it varies so much and we have a lack of consistency from county to county. Um, but in many um, classifications in many counties, there can be a significant fringe amount that's added there. Um, and again, contractors get credits against the total amount that has to be paid for that classification based upon um, what they're contributing um, in, in the form of uh, approved fringe benefits. Okay. Thank you very much, Lori. We're going to have to move on. Senator Rahm, do you have a question? Um, maybe it's quick, but I just wondered if it was possible to compare to what states like Massachusetts and New York do, because I imagine we'd lose some quality workers uh, to those states that I feel like probably have this standard in place or have higher um, union standards and prevailing wage standards. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to move to Becky. David, I just want to make sure we get Becky in for sure, and we'll go over a little bit and hear from you, David, next. Um, you want to walk us through the amendment? Um, Becky, welcome. Is it posted, Scott, on our webpage? Not yet. I can do that right now. Oh, great. Uh, so I'll just uh, say my name for the record, Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council, and I'll just follow up on what um, Lori was speaking to that the the forty two and a half percent is actually in statute. So, um, and that hasn't changed since twenty fifteen. So that's where where that number is based from. Um, if I, I, I just let me know when you all have the amendment up, and I can start walking through it. Can we do? Can you uh, share a screen and put it up in front of us? Is that possible? If not, just go ahead. I'll, I'll okay. Do. Yeah, I have it up on another on another device, okay. so I, it'll just take me a second if you want me to sh share my screen. Yeah, and it should be up pretty quickly on our on our web page. My apologies, I'm not sure why it's not there yet. Um, mine is opening if uh, okay. you would like me to share it. Go ahead, please. Can you all see that? Okay, um, so this is um, an amendment to the Budget Adjustment Act, which is H679. And it would be adding in um, this new section 71A, uh, imposing a prevailing wage requirement on American Rescue Plan Act uh, funds. Um, so there were a lot of questions about what is what is in this language. I'll just I'll just um, respond to those as I walk through it. Um, so in subsection A one, um, it says except as provided in subsection B, and subsection B is going to deal with the retroactive um, question that came up about the con the funds that were appropriated previously and maybe under contract. Um, so the uh, requirement is that any contract awarded for a maintenance, construction, or improvement project that receives 200000 or more in ARPA funds shall provide that all construction employees working on the project shall be paid not less than the mean prevailing wage published periodically by the Department of Labor in its wage survey. Um, and additional 
Um, oh, I, th I think that I, that's actually missing an and there. And an additional fringe benefit of 42 and one half percent of wage as calculated by the current Vermont prevailing wage survey. Um, and this uh, calculation is the same as uh, what is in statute for currently for this um, state uh, prevailing wage that applies to the um, projects that come out of the capital bill. And then the definition of fringe benefits is also the same as what's in statute. So that is subdivision two on line 14. Uh, fringe benefit means benefits including paid vacations and holidays, sick leave, employer contributions and reimbursements to health insurance and retirement benefits and similar, similar benefits that are incidents of employment. So subsection B is what this does not apply to. So the requirements of subsection B, um, subsection A do not apply to any maintenance, construction, or improvement project that received uh, 200,000 or more in uh, ARPA funds appropriated prior to the effective date of this act, if any of the following apply as of the effective date of this act. So if it received um, I think last year's uh, budget was when some uh, ARPA dollars were appropriated. So if it received an appropriation in that bill and any of the following um, have happened prior to the effective date of the Budget Adjustment Act, this would, uh, this would not apply. So the project has been invited or advertised for bid, the project is under contract or the funds are obligated. Um, so I tried to uh, envision uh, each scenario where um, the where this would be a, a problem applying it retroactively and potentially cause a contracts clause issue. Um, and then subsection C is what um, you were all just speaking about about the application of the Davis Bacon Act. So subsection A also does not apply to any contracts awarded um, for construction projects that are required by law to comply with the requirements of federal Davis-Bacon. Good. Thanks. Very, very straightforward, I think. Okay, so um, anybody- Do you want me to keep the share up for now or take it down? You could it, leave it there for now, but uh, does anybody it, have it, any questions for Becky? It, it's up on our website, just so people know. I've been following it there. It's easier to read. I I I have a question, Mr. Chair. Senator, which is, Senator Clarkson. Is uh two hundred thousand uh the right uh threshold? And that's uh, my question just because the the federal the treasury identifying 10 million is is obviously really uh, there's a huge difference between the two. And I um I'm just curious what uh, what Matt's feeling was on that, what David's feeling and Lori's feeling, the, our, two, our three experts in, in, in this. I, I just love your input on the threshold amount. And I'll, I'll just clarify that really quickly, that this isn't a total, that threshold is not a total construction cost. It's just the total amount of the construction costs that are coming from ARPA dollars. So it is different uh, than what is current law for state construction projects, which, sa which says that the total construction cost has to be 200 or more and um, at least 50% funded by the capital bill. So this is um, not looking at the, the total cost of the project, but how much is coming from ARPA funds. Uh, but I'll let others speak to their thoughts on that amount. So this is, this is much higher than Mini right. David make it as a threshold in two regards. First, it's twice the amount. Uh, and second, it's uh, just based on the source of funding, not on the total construction. On, under Minnie Davis Bacon, right now under, this, uh, under the capital bill, you could have uh, a program that has um, $25,000 in general fund uh, in it combined with matching funds or other sources of $75,000 and you would still have to be covered because the total project costs would be $100,000 and it would fall under here. We're saying it's $200,000 and it's all from opera funds. Is that correct, Becky? 
Okay. It, it's right. I mean, the project could be a $10 million project. It could be a $200,000 project, but it's, if it's all coming from, if, if that 200,000 is coming from ARPA, right. then it triggers this requirement. Okay, good. Um, any other questions for, for Becky? Thanks so much, Becky. Um, let's move on quickly to David. David, a couple of, can do, do it in less than five minutes and then we'll take, yes. a, we'll take some questions and then we'll take a break. Okay, yes, I hear the bells ringing in Montpelier, it's 10 o'clock, so I'll be quick. Um, I just want to uh, say that um, actually um, the, the Vermont's prevailing wage statute was part of a compromise and many, many um, weeks of discussion. And we worked closely, sorry, I didn't introduce myself, it's been a while, David Mickenberg on behalf of the Vermont Building and Construction Trades Council. Um, but the AGC, and myself and others came up with this um, carefully crafted compromise to reflect sort of the Vermont values when it comes to funding construction projects, which um, Vermont has been uh, involved in, in a mini Davis-Bacon in some sort uh, since 1996. So it, like the 1931 federal Davis-Bacon, Vermont has for many years uh, uh, had uh, prevailing wage in construction as a value um, that we put forward. So this um, amendment, which we uh, fully support, um, is in line with current policy. And I think it's really, in my, in my mind, a sort of true up to what um, our uh, Vermont policy is in many other areas. So I don't have a lot to add. Lori and Matt's um, comments reflected the comments that I had in terms of the federal uh, government's guidance on Minnie Davis-Bacon uh, uh, applying um, in these cases. I know the state of Maine is looking at this uh, to Senator Sorokin's question. So there are other states um, that are looking uh, at doing something like this. Um, I'm comfortable with our sort of current enforcement regime in terms of how the Department of Labor and others would enforce this. Um, it's not an issue uh, uh, that, that raises any concern. And, and to reflect Matt's comments, I think contractors, given how long that contractors in Vermont, unionized, non-unionized contractors have been working with our prevailing wage statute, they're very comfortable with this. And I don't see any uh, issues in the folks that we work with, certainly in terms of, um, in terms of applying this in the bid documents and then throughout the process. So I uh, really appreciate the time. The, the one question, Senator Clarkson, that you had about the threshold, obviously, um, we would be more supportive of a lower threshold, but um, totally appreciate why the threshold is set at what it is and support it um, as, as written. So uh, appreciate you taking the time. I think this is a, a, an amendment that's worthy of support that will um, help workers, the economy. I'm happy to come back another time and, and talk about the benefits of prevailing wage and uh, the impacts uh, that they have on local economies and things like that. But um, I know I'm running short on time. So thank you very much. Senator Brock. Uh, uh, Dave, do you have uh, any idea as to how much this will cost? Uh, no, I haven't done a cost estimate, but given the testimony around what the current marketplace um, that, that Matt described and, and certainly the contractors that we work with um, who actually pay above this amount, um, uh, I don't, I don't, I can't anticipate that the cost would be, um, anything if not, uh, if, if anything, not dramatic, but I don't, I have not done that analysis. So one of the things that is going to admittedly be an unknown Senator Brock, we have what $500 million left in ARPA funds. We have no idea how much of that's going to go to construction. So well, based on what our experience has been in the past, uh, David, do you have any idea of what the difference is between contractors who pay the prevailing wage and contractors who do not in construction projects in Vermont? Uh, is there a difference between the two? And if so, what magnitude? Um, well, as we heard today, I think generally contractors, at least right now in our current uh, market, are, are paying this, if not more. Um, one of the things that was mentioned, perhaps there could be contractors 
um, that may be paying less. And the question I guess I would put back on the committee is, is that something that we would be supportive of? Because in our policy, whether it's in the Capital Construction Act or uh, DOT money that flows or um, a variety of different ways in which prevailing wages apply, we have put out the value of wanting to uh, pay reasonable wages and benefits that support middle-class jobs. So I don't know that we would want to um, peg our policy to the lowest common denominator, um, given the values that the state of Vermont has has put forward since 1996 and the federal government since 1931 in a bipartisan way. Do you have any comments on that question, Matt? You, are you speaking to the cost question? Is that correct? Yeah, I'm just curious. I mean, I, I would, I don't know, but I would assume that um, some of the bigger companies anyhow, they're gonna pay the prevailing wage, whether it's a federally funded project or not, they're not going to tell their workers, you know, you're on this job at one rate, and then you're at another job at another rate, and we're going to change your wages. I can only speak to what I know, and that's my membership. And yeah. like I said, they are the, you know, we, we're, we're talking about the, the highest level performers in our, in our industry, and I can't speak to people that aren't within my membership, but you are correct in that they they compete with each other for these bids, but more importantly, you'll see us competing with each other for, for the even more finite resource, which is human beings right now. So uh, I don't know that in my membership, there would be an additional cost driver. And, and how many members, Matt, again, do you have? Uh, we have around 150 contractor members, uh, 200 when you add our electrical division. And so does that mean that in terms of the wages that you're paying right now, you're paying the prevailing wage along with the 42% benefit typically for your membership? So I don't, I haven't done the specific calculation, but when you add up health insurance, life insurance, uh, 401k matches and all that stuff, I do believe we are in that ballpark. Well, I guess the question comes to mind that if that's already being done, why is the bill necessary? Well, I guess, Senator, if I can take a shot at answering that, um, you know, that's what's happening now. But as we've seen in the past, that has not always been the case. That's the point of the prevailing wage law. And um, in terms of competitiveness, um, I think this does allow Vermont to be competitive for workers on some level to Senator Rom's Hins Rom Hinsdale's um, question previously. The state of Massachusetts actually ties its Davis, its mini Davis Bacon to the prevailing union contract in this in that state, which oftentimes is higher. We are not doing that here. We're reflecting the actual uh, rates that are being paid throughout the state. So I think from a competitive perspective, um, I think this is an important step so that we can, in fact, uh, to Matt's point, attract workers that can be here to do the jobs that we're asking them to do. Well, I guess that, again, is my fundamental question. If the prevailing wage is the wage that's actually being paid, what's the difference? If, if it's the prevailing union wage, and that's not what we're saying here, I can understand the difference. But it would seem like the prevailing wage is the wage that's actually being paid, isn't it? Well, it's done through a, it, over the course of time in different areas in the calculation from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. So it's reflecting, a, I think it's a mean uh, wage. So... Um, there is a difference there, but I think uh, the, the point here is that we as a state have to decide whether we want to set uh, a, a basic level of fair wage and benefits through the 42 and a half percent to make us competitive, but also to pay workers um, an appropriate amount on, fun, on projects that are funded through state dollars or that flow through the state. And so, um, but I don't have the, to your original question, I don't have the specific cost of that, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, uh, may I just add before we depart, Mr. Chair, that this has an opportunity to attract relocated workers. I mean, maybe not Massachusetts and New York, but man, it, it, uh, if we manage to do this, this sounds like it may be one of our, our additional tools in our relocated workers toolbox. I will note, Senator, that um, New Hampshire, I, and I stand to be corrected, but New Hampshire does not have a mini Davis-Bacon law. So right on our border, yeah. So right on our border, we could conceivably be attracting workers to come and uh, work uh, for Matt's contractors. 
Maybe they can build some houses to live. (laughs) Okay, I'm I'm gonna um, at least let this sit until the end of our hearing this morning, and we'll take a straw poll as to what we want to recommend to um, appropriations on this. Uh, So right now, thank you all very much. It's 10 after 10. Uh, Chris, thank you. Thank you so much. Everybody, thank you. And why don't we take a 10 minute break till eight, excuse me, 1020. Great. Thank you, everybody. Bye.